Welcome to the Real Deals Podcast, the consistently number one real estate investing podcast on iTunes. This is the place to be in order to transform yourself from a hopeful investor to a highly skilled deal finder. Now, without further ado, let's get into the show. Rise and shine, make you want to say, dear God, let me thank you for another day. Been living life on the edge and I'm trying to break it. I'm tired of ducking the fears, but it's a struggle to make it. So this is your day, homie, now it's time to shine. Hey, for players only cheaping, we can wine and dine. Stress free from the drama, better get your ticket. Then come on, cause the squares can't lie to kick it. What's up, everybody out there in listening, man? This is episode 208. Hey, I got another great episode for you this week. It's going to be a solo show. You know, I know we've been doing a lot of interviews lately, and I dig doing the interviews. I love talking to people about real estate, real estate investing, their businesses, kind of where they're at. And I just think there's a ton of value in that, both for me personally, you know, it's a big enjoyment, but also for you guys in the listener arena out there in listener land. But... I miss you guys, and I want to have a solo show because that's pretty much how we started the podcast. We did solo shows, right? And as I talked to Joe about in last week's show, if you have not already, go check that out. Joe Evangelisti was our guest for last week, and we were talking about the first time I tried to podcast, and I sat behind the microphone in my home office, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this thing a dry run here and see if I can actually talk for a sustained amount of time on any given topic. And I made it about eight seconds before I had some long pauses and didn't know which way to take, you know, what it is that I was talking about. And, you know, it's an acquired skill, right? So then I worked through it. And of course, the probably the first 50 episodes or thereabout, most of them were solo shows. And here we are at episode 208. And I could probably talk for days and you guys are probably saying, all right, get to the point already. But the point is, I'm going to do this week's show on a topic that is, is something that's near and dear to me because it's it's something that I have been going through to some extent lately and it's something that we all go through in multiple times. It's not just like you go through this one time, but it's a maturation of growth in the business and as your business grows and as you become a real business. But this, this week's topic is going to be all about are you an investor or are you a business owner? And what does that progression look like, right? At what point do you go from just being an investor trying to make money to a business owner who's investing and trying to make money? And really the process generally for the most successful people is they start off as a real estate investor. Then they eventually, a lot of people will grow into a business owner that invests in real estate. And then eventually as they build up their net worth and their capital and and just, I guess we'll call it burnout a little bit on you know dealing with the daily problems of running an active investment company, they then usually kind of slide back into passive investor role later on in life where they can basically take a little less return, but they've already built up a large amount of capital. And for that little less return, they take a lot less stress and just daily brain damage of running the operation. So it's this cycle that most of us go through. And so what I want to break down in this week's show is the skill sets required to go from investor to business owner that invests in real estate, because they're really two entirely different skill sets. And a lot of us, you know, when people are pushing programs and things like that to you, or you're, you know, you're listening to podcasts, most of the time you're going to listen to the podcasts that give you those, you know, kind of investing tips, right? Tips that could help you land a deal or find a deal, right? And those are important. But at the end of the day, those are like the entry level beginner tips, really, you know, the bigger skill sets that you need to learn and master as time goes on is being the best business owner that you can be. Because ultimately, you know, once you break the solo entrepreneur threshold and you start bringing people on in order to allow your business to grow, now you're a business owner. And a lot of people get stuck in solopreneur land and, and they're investors and they do fine and they make good money for what it is that they want. Of course, depending on your market, some markets you can make more or less, you know, depending on price points and all that as a solopreneur investor. But at some point, if you want to continue to grow and you want to continue to build your legacy and just build stuff, because, you know, a lot of us that are entrepreneurial types, we just, we want to build and being simply an investor solopreneur just isn't enough in terms of satisfaction in life, really. I mean, you know, money only satisfies you so much. And so as you continue to grow and you feel the desire to grow an actual business and leave a footprint and a legacy and and, you know, be able to add people to your team and provide a good lifestyle for them as well. There's a lot of different skill sets that you need to acquire. So I want to go through all that. I want to go through what I've learned, me personally, here in my own business, what I continue to learn as we, you know, advance forward into pivoting and growth mode here in the Portland area and in my own business of TTM Development Company. And 
so I think there's a lot of things that you guys can take away from that. And so that's why I want to do a solo show this week. So hopefully you guys are going to dig it. Well, I know you guys are going to dig it. Now, before we get into all that, one thing I want to say is that if you guys are getting value out of this podcast, which if you're listening, you damn well should, right? Because I put a lot of value into this thing and we've been doing this thing for four years plus now every single week. If you could go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review, we would greatly appreciate it. If you think it's awesome, leave me a five-star review. If you think I suck, leave me a one-star review. We've never got a one-star review, but all I'm saying is go take the time, leave us a rating and review, and also hit subscribe if you would, and subscribe to the show. We would greatly appreciate it. We're trying to grow the show. You know, we put a ton into this, and you know, obviously we feel it is the absolute best real estate investing podcast out there in terms of actual information that's tangible and not just fluffy, high-five, rah-rah stuff, which there's a lot of. And so if you guys could go give us a rating and review and subscribe to the podcast, it would be hugely beneficial to us because that is how you play the iTunes algorithm game. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. Now, enough ranting and raving about doing that. I assume many of you will do it without prodding. So what I want to get onto is our housekeeping items. Number one is our Driving for Dollars app. We have a podcast for that, folks. If you use it, I suggest you subscribe to the podcast. It's also on iTunes. It's just the Driving for Dollars podcast. And on it, you know, I, I'm using that podcast as a platform to give you guys user tips on how to better use the app and how to better use Driving for Dollars. So go check it out and subscribe to it. It's free. And the information that I put in there is everything that you need to know in order to best utilize Driving for Dollars and best utilize the app so you can get as much value out of it as possible. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you is, well, actually, you guys are probably listening to this on Thursday and Friday. And if you're listening to it Thursday or Friday, probably this next week, we're going to be switching over our billing structure for the Driving for Dollars app. And I've been talking about this for a while. iTunes has finally allowed us to do it as well as Google Play. And so basically it's gonna go to a monthly cost to use the app, but it's a fantastic value for you guys that are using it. And it allows us as the creators of the software and the app to have a little more predictable revenue so we can continue to invest in it on a monthly basis to add enhancements and improvements and things like that. A couple that I mentioned on the Driving for Dollars podcast is we're gonna have a tracking system put on the app so it can show you which streets you've driven on any given list that you're gonna be building. And then also we're gonna put in, we got this really cool idea for an algorithm we're going to create to really kind of identify from all the data that we can pull on these properties, which ones are most likely to sell sooner than later, because there's definitely data behind that. And so those are a couple things along with a bunch of other, we got a long laundry list, but those are kind of a couple really cool ones that we're going to be looking to put into place. But by switching it over to this monthly billing model, it allows us to have more predictable revenue. And because of that, we can now continue to invest in it and make it better and better. Now on the flip side, for you guys that use it, it makes your cost per lead insanely cheap for those of you guys that choose to use it on an ongoing basis. And so basically the monthly cost is going to be about 19, 20 bucks a month. And with that, you get unlimited data. So you can build as many lists as you want. You can pull as much data as you want. And it's only about 20 bucks a month. So phenomenal deal. You can get your cost per lead down to, you know, under one cent very easily, depending on how big of a list you build or lists that you continue to build. But you get all the data that you get, which is owner information, mailing address, mortgage information, first and second mortgages. You get the last sale amount, sale date. And then of course you get the almighty phone number as well. So you get all that stuff under one roof with just a click of a button and it's only 19, 20 bucks a month, super cheap. And you can get a tremendous value out of that. But again, it's a great win for you guys. And then also it's a great win for us. We're kind of taking the cell phone model where we understand some people are going to use it more and some people are going to use it less. And so by doing that, we can offer a tremendous deal to everybody. And that way you guys can build your lists in a cost effective manner and get as much data as you need. The other thing that I wanted to mention here in our housekeeping items is break down real quick. We've got two different communities for those of you guys that listen that help you along your investing journey. And the first is our DFA Launchpad and the other is our DFA. And so basically we set up two because the DFA Launchpad is meant for people that are at the very beginning of the real estate investing journey. They're trying to start the process of, you know, maybe going direct to seller, but they're really just kind of new to real estate investing and they want to get this thing off the ground and they want to do it in a way that's cost effective and try and make as few mistakes as possible. The DFA is our mastermind community for people that have established real estate investing businesses. And we've got about 120 some odd folks from all over the country and from all the major metro areas that communicate on a monthly basis in our private Facebook group. And we've just built some tremendous relationships, both myself and everybody else within the community with each other over the last, you know, almost four years that we've had it in place now. So that's kind of the breakdown. So if you guys are out there in listener land and you're looking to get started in real estate investing, reach out to us. The DFA Launchpad is probably the best place to start. 
part. If you have a more established business, you've been a real estate investor for a while, maybe you're doing foreclosure sales or short sales, or you're buying off RMLS, things like that, and you want to transition to being able to go direct to seller, that would be a good candidate for people to join DFA versus the DFA Launchpad. And also, if you just want to surround yourself with other people that are doing amazing things from renovations to rentals to new construction to funds to everything, that would be the DFA. So basically, if you're newer, the DFA Launchpad is for you. And if you're more established, you've been in the business for a little bit, the DFA is the better spot for you. So that's kind of the breakdown. I just want to clarify for all you guys out there in listener land. And if you're interested in joining us in either of those, please reach out to us and we will let you know which one's probably the best fit for you. And we can kind of start that conversation. Both are conversation first with Dan. And then from there, we figure out what's best for you. And we want to make sure that we're putting you in the right place. Now, I had one individual during our last open doors to the DFA Launchpad that they were were concerned about what exactly it entailed. And so I wanted to go through real quick here, just the value that is provided in any sort of coaching program, right? The DFA Launchpad, the DFA, the DFA Launchpad is more of a coaching program slash community. The DFA is more of a mastermind slash community, right? But basically here's the truth, folks. There's only so much value that you can get out of raw information, right? Tips, tricks, strategies, things like that. There's only so much value and there's only so many of those things around. And so there's basic value in those things. The true value in any community mastermind or coaching program is the implementation of simple ideas. That's it. It really breaks down to that. And so as you are starting to implement very simple strategies and investing techniques and ideas and concepts and talking with sellers, it's the implementation phase where the most value is given if you have somebody that you can ask those questions of that actually knows what the hell they're doing or a community of people that know what the hell they're doing. That's where the true value comes in because everybody can read all the investing strategies, tips, tricks, whatever, how to's that you can. But the reality is, is that about only 10% of it sticks. The rest of it sticks through action and through application of the information. And that's the point where everybody has the most questions. And ultimately, that is the point where the most value is given in any sort of coaching program or mastermind community. So think about that, folks. It's a big aha that people need to wrap their heads around. I know a lot of you guys have, have understood that that are part of our communities. But if you're looking to join a community, that's the thing that provides the most value to you. Trust me, we've talked to millions, not millions, but thousands of people over the last four years. And uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds of people in all of our uh, communities and that is where the most value is given. So just want to get that kind of out there so that you guys can understand where true value is in any sort of investment that you make in yourself and being a part of a coaching program or a mastermind community. Now, I will quit rambling about that and let's go into real quick what's up with me and TTM over the course of the past week before we get into the main topic. It's moving week, folks. By the time you listen to this, I've got the movers lined up. They'll be coming tomorrow or the next day and I'll finally be moving into my new house. It's been a long process. I am glad that it's over. I'll tell you that right now. You know, building a house for yourself as a business owner and investor, it takes a lot out of you. It definitely does, especially with two kids and just a lot of resources, right? Financially, time, emotionally, all those things. It doesn't seem like it would if this is what you do every day, but it really does, especially when you've got a a family and and time constraints and things like that. But anyway, we're getting to the finish line. We're done. I'm happy. We're moving out on Saturday and then I'm closing the sale of my old house on Monday. So we had a really seamless transition with that, especially for a $1.7 million home. It's pretty unheard of to have a transition like that. So I'm super stoked about that. Gets money exchanging hands very quickly after we're moved out, which is always nice, right? So super excited. But by the time you guys hear this, I will be on my way to loading the moving truck, thankfully. Now, one last thing I want to mention is if you guys have not already, make sure that you like our TTM Development Company Facebook page. We're starting a new thing where we're going to be doing probably three, four times a week, kind of a design showcase of a lot of our work that we've done in the past and stuff that we're doing now. We spend a lot of time on design. We do a ton of things to basically show the world, you know, how great our houses are. And I know I'm patting myself on the back there, but we spend a lot of time to do really good design, really good floor plans. And it's kind of our thing that most investors, most people in real estate investing don't do. As we talked about in last week's show with Joe, you know, a lot of people just focus on the stuff that makes all the money or the best return, we'll call it. And those types of houses don't necessarily show up well on Instagram or Facebook in terms of pictures posted. But for us, we do a mix, right? We do some stuff that generates great return, but then we do some really amazing homes that we build and that we renovate. And so we want to showcase a lot of that. And we're going to be doing probably three, four, five posts a week that really showcase the best design that we've done and that we're doing. And I think you guys really enjoy it. So go check out our TTM Development Company Facebook page so that you guys can see it. Without further ado, let's get into the rest of the show.
All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best hands down in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Iron Bridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, guys, time to get into the main topic. That's right. And this week's main topic, as I mentioned in the intro, something that has been on my mind a lot lately, which is, of course, why I'm talking about it. But it's the difference between being an investor and being a business owner. And it's a very dramatic difference. And I think it's something that we often forget about or don't recognize. And that can lead people down the wrong paths. It can set you up for failure. And it can basically, you cannot be prepared for what you're getting into, right? And so it's good to know what's coming. And so hope that's the whole idea behind the show is that I tell you what's coming, you know, for those of you that are on the same path, or maybe you're, you know, much earlier on in your journey, at least you can listen to my experiences and, you know, some good, some bad, and you can hopefully apply that information as you kind of continue on your own journey. Or, you know, maybe some of these decisions or, you know, changes in your business and the way you do things are coming up much closer and you can kind of pivot a little bit based on what I say. So what I want to talk about here is the differences between being simply an investor and being a business owner. And so we'll say investor, right? That's generally where you start. That's like the first, you know, we'll call it the first stop on the, I want to get into real estate train, right? You start off as an investor. And as an investor, you're really only focused on one thing, right? You want to make money. That's it. That's your sole focus as an investor. And so Sometimes there's there's value provided there, but most of the time we're just trying to make money. And so, you know, whatever that looks like, whether that's, you know, sourcing a deal that we find at 60 cents on the dollar and we sell it to somebody else at 70 cents on the dollar and let them renovate it and take it to market. We're providing a little bit of value, but we're not providing a ton of value. We're, the value we're providing is giving somebody a project to work on and we're taking a profit for that, which, you know, there's value there. But in terms of value to the end market, not a ton. And so there's some skill sets that change with that. But more importantly, you know, as you start off as an investor, the main skill sets that you need to understand, and this is really, like I mentioned in the intro, where most people focus all their attention. And that's why I'm bringing this up. But the main skill sets is number one, finding deals, right? How do you effectively and consistently find deals? That's a big thing. That seems to be the biggest, you know, gray area in terms of how you do it and what people are drawn to the most, because of course, that's where the biggest opportunity lies within the investor skill set. So understanding marketing, right? Understanding where to look, how to market, how to get the phone ringing, how to get people reaching out to you that are interested in potentially selling their home. And if you can get enough people reaching out to you that are potentially interested in selling their home, then a small percentage of those people will sell it at a big enough discount for there to be money for you to make, whether you're going to take it all the way to retail or whether you're going to sell it to somebody who will, or you're going to hold it as some type of a longer term investment. 
So that's the first skill. Second skill is going to be obviously understanding values, right? You got to understand real estate values in your area because that's what this whole thing is predicated on. You got to understand value in order to determine whether or not you have a deal. You know, another skill is talking with sellers, right? This is an acquired skill. It takes a little bit of work. It's a little bit higher level skill for an investor because some investors simply, you know, they buy at the auctions or they buy off RMLS or through realtors or pocket listings or things like that. And they don't ever develop that skill of being able to talk to sellers, which now is a, a very popular topic because that's if you want to really take control of your own destiny in this business, you have to get good at it, which is no surprise based on where we're at in the market cycle. But talking to sellers is kind of an elevated skill set for your generic type investor, right? But it's still a skill set for the investor. You have to get good at, you know, networking. Networking is a big thing as an investor. You got to network with agents, attorneys, you know, other wholesalers potentially in your area that are worth a shit. That's a skill set that you have to get good at. So those are the main things. Oh, and of course, estimating costs, although most people that are in, under the investor category would say they're very shitty at estimating costs because they haven't stepped into the business owner role yet. But you have to be able to at least be able to put some numbers to projects that that require renovation. And as I said, most people that are simply in the investor phase they're not very good at it, but you got to try, right? And you got to try and get better at it over time. So those are the general skill sets that you have to understand. And the better you understand those, the better you're going to be as an investor. And then of course, just real estate in general as itself, right? You know, understanding parts of your market, you know, what's part of your market's good for new construction, what part of your market's good for rentals, what part of your market's good for renovation projects, that kind of stuff. And so those are the main skill sets required uh, in order to simply be an investor. And you could, you know, most investors are solopreneur types that, you know, maybe they hire a contractor here and there, you know, a GC contractor to basically take care of their projects for them. And they can remain in that solopreneur type investor role, which again, you can make good money in that role, but you're limited that your business can only be so big. You can only do so much because there's only so many of you, right? One of you. And it also requires that you build a whole nother, you know, layer of skill sets or multiple layers of skill sets in order to advance beyond simply being an investor. And so that's where I think that a lot of people get, they just don't think about it, we'll call it, right? Because, you know, you get into being an investor and then, you know, you trip over yourself and before you know it, you're now wearing a business owner hat that invests in real estate, but you haven't developed a lot of the skill sets that you need to develop as a business owner in order to truly be successful as a bigger entity that you've now created, right? And so very important stuff to think about and just that that whole process. So let's jump into the business owner side of things, right? As a business owner, and this is something that me personally you know, I didn't really recognize, especially when I started my mortgage company back in the day, right? I was a great loan originator fantastic for what I could do. Now, I could have been a lot better. I didn't understand marketing. I understood networking. I was good at networking, which is why ultimately, you know, I did well as a loan originator. But then once I stepped into the business owner arena, which is I opened my own mortgage brokerage, I sucked. I mean, I, the business did well, we made money, but I was a terrible manager. I was a terrible business owner. And these are all skill sets that y you're not going to out of the box be great at, but I didn't even recognize the fact that I needed to build these skill sets. I didn't recognize the fact that, you know, these skill sets are imperative to ultimately running a successful operation. You couldn't just be a great loan originator and run a great mortgage brokerage. Just like you can't just be a great investor and run a great real estate investing company. You cannot do it. And so the skill sets that you need to acquire and build and recognize that you need to build over time as the actual business owner is number one, management of people, right? This is the biggest problem that I see, especially with real estate investors, because there's a lot of terrible personalities in this world of real estate investing. Let's just be honest. And I don't know why it is, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of get rich quick type people and they have a very investor type mindset where they're so damn cheap that they're just a pain in the ass to deal with. And so if you move that over to business owner and managing the business and ultimately just managing people, they're not good at it. And so you have to get better at dealing with people. You have to improve your personality first and foremost in terms of being able to manage people, get along with people, interact with people. And that's that's really the number one thing that you need to do. Now, there's a lot of secondary skills to that that you also have to be very, very good at or you'll crash and burn as well. But number one is going to be management of people. And that's, I think, where I struggled the most when I first stepped into the role as business owner with my mortgage company. And then ultimately, 
I wasn't the greatest manager of people when I started the development company either, but I've gotten better over time. And really, I've gotten better at recognizing what's acceptable and what's not and what's expected and what's not of people. Because that was the biggest thing for me is that I had expectations, but they weren't crystal clear. And I wasn't good at delivering to people what my expectations of them are. And then I'd let people slide. And before you know it, you're kind of running a loosey-goosey operation. And uh, you've got tons of inefficiencies within your business. And while things are good and times are good and you're making money, you just absorb the inefficiencies. And when I say absorb the inefficiencies, if you're absorbing the costs that people are either costing you by bad decision or indecision, you know, where you could be much more productive or you could just be spending a lot less money. Money on certain projects or things that just was kind of a waste. And so that's a big, big thing. You have to be able to recognize that. So understanding, you know, basically what you need to expect from people and then being able to manage people so that you get those things out of them. That's a big thing. And that was, that's a big struggle that I had when I first hired loan officers. I hired some of the biggest jerk off idiots looking back that now they'd come sit in my office and I'd be, there's no fucking way, no fucking way I would hire these idiots. But back then I just didn't see what I didn't see. And so, you know, they took me on a little bit of a roller coaster ride, ended up in court because of one of them. But more importantly, you know, I just didn't run a very good business overall. And now I can reflect back and say those things. And it would have been a little tougher at the time for me to take a look in the mirror and recognize that. But, you know, basically you have to be able to recognize who people are. And that's part of managing people, understanding what their limitations are, but also being able to set expectations. There's actually a great book that I read back in the day that my wife, who was at the time, just my girlfriend gave me when I started the mortgage company. And it's it was called It's Okay to Be the Boss. And I think that's, you know, the overarching theme of that book was it's okay for you to not like the way people are doing things and to tell them that they need to buck up and, you know, do what's expected of them. And so a lot of people don't like confrontation or friction. And so that's why they're not good at the management of people role that you have to take on as a business owner. Now, of course, at some point you can have people that manage people, but you still have to manage the managers and you have to make sure you're hiring the right people for that. So that's a big, big skill set. Now, the next skill set, and this is the thing that, you know, buries a lot of people, or at least it's a big misstep along the journey, is cash flow. Cash flow is huge. As an investor, you have very limited overhead, you know, your marketing campaigns and, you know, paying your living expenses. That's really it, right? That's pretty much all you have to deal with because you're generally in and out of projects pretty quickly. You're wholesaling mainly, occasionally you're doing a wholesale. And so cash flow is really, can I afford or have I factored to send out mail or marketing each month, uh, which you should be because you got to be consistent. But that's really the extent of, you know, the understanding of cash flow and, and predicting cash flow that you need to do. As you step into the business owner role and you start taking on projects, multiple projects, different types of projects, longer projects, now you're getting into two things. Number one is you're getting into capital investment, understanding how to properly invest capital. Or, you know, if you're leveraging, then you got to understand this as well, but it ties in real close to cash flow. And so cash flow can bury people. And this is probably the biggest misstep that people make as they go from investor to business owner that invests in real estate is predicting their cash flow. And it's something that you're going to continually struggle with. There's never like an easy, oh, it's just a smooth sailing. It's always a challenge and cash flow is what is going to keep you awake at night. It's the things that are going to, you know, make your your mind race while you're, you know, on the weekend, you're sitting with your family and your kids and your wife's going, why aren't you here present with me? Because you're thinking about cash flow. You're thinking about how you can improve it. You're thinking about how you can tweak it. This is the thing that's going to haunt you forever and it never, ever goes away. It just gets a little easier to understand it and understand what you need to do and what you need to expect from people in order to improve it. But as you get into bigger projects and you get into multiple projects, this is a huge skill. It's a huge skill because you've got acquisition, you've got construction, you've got overhead of the office, you've got salaries, you've got invoices that come in for all the construction on a continual basis. It's a big skill set and you really need to understand where you're at all the time. And this is where... You know, I think a lot of people miss this step because they decide to outsource cash flow. And when I say that, I mean that they bring on somebody to do their books and they think that that's just going to prevent them from having problems. And that's not it at all. The people that do your books are simply logging bills and paying bills. It's not their job to be able to predict your cash flow and understand what you're getting into and what any project is going to require money wise. That's your job. That's your business owner skill. You being the driver of your ship need to understand that. And so this is a huge skill set. Probably the most important skill set is that. And then you couple that with capital investment, how to invest the capital that you have the best way possible to make the best return, but also in the wisest manner so that you don't bury yourself with cash flow obligations when you don't have a whole lot of cash flow coming in. So big thing there. 
the next thing, which kind of plays along with that, and I mentioned this, is stress management, right? As you step out of investor role into business owner role, you're putting your neck out there a lot more because you're bringing people on to your ship. You're the visionary. You're the one that's pushing the envelope and you're putting your neck out there a little bit more, whether it be financially, legally, whatever it is, right? And so stress management is a huge thing. And this is the biggest thing that sets most people back permanently in life. They just don't develop the skill set to be able to manage stress and mitigate it. And there's always going to be stress. It's it's the way that it is. And I often tell people when we do our consulting calls, if you had taken the me of eight, 10 years ago and you put them in the position that I'm in right now, I'd probably be balled up in the corner in a feeble position, kind of rocking back and forth and crying because you're just, you're not built for this out of the box. It's a skill set that you continually build over time. You get better at handling. And ultimately that's the biggest reason why people that, you know, inherit a lot of money generally, or they win the lottery, they go broke a few years later because they just have not developed the skill sets necessary to manage that money and the stress and things that come along with it, which is recognizing people's flaws, recognizing who should touch the money and who shouldn't, what you should do with it, all those things, right? Those are skills that you build up over time. But number one thing here that I want to make the point of, is stress management. You have to get better at managing stress. And I think ultimately as a society, we are just shitty at managing stress. Everybody has an excuse these days because they have just a little bit of stress in their life. And for whatever reason, you know, that makes them so upset that they, you know, are difficult to deal with or they do terrible things or whatever. So I think as a society, we're kind of a bunch of punanis and we really need to recognize that we need to work on stress management and stress is a normal part of life. And you just, you have to get better at dealing with it. That's really what it, what it comes down to. The other thing you really need to understand is more market cycles, right? Market cycles as a business owner. Now you're deploying capital, you're taking on cash flow obligations. You need to understand the real estate cycles and the economic cycles, because this is something that I saw a lot of builders get buried in the last downturn. And the last downturn was pretty severe, but you have to recognize that the good times only last for so long. And you got to put yourself, you know, in front of a runaway train. You got, you got to pull yourself out of the way sometimes if you think that things are running away and you want to kind of take a little bit of risk off the table, taking on certain types of projects projects or not, depending on where you think we're at in the cycle within your own market. Big thing, big thing for sure. And then the last thing is the visionary role, right? Most people that are in the investor role or just the employee role, they come to work, they log hours and they don't think beyond the day. And you as the business owner, you have to be a visionary. You have to constantly be thinking about where do you want the business to go? What do you want it to do? What do you want that to look like? And then dial that back into the practical application of the daily tasks that need to be done in order to ultimately get there or keep you on the path there. So being a visionary, that's again, a skill set that is built over time, you know, that to get good at that, you know, a lot of people have a lot of crazy harebrained ideas, but to be able to come up with an idea and then execute on that, that is the skill set of a great business owner. So Those are the biggest differences. And, you know, you need to recognize that you start off as an investor. And if you continue in this business, you move into business owner. And, you know, that's one of the big reasons why last week uh, we're talking to Joe and he does the uh, Flip King CEO podcast because he now talks mainly to people that are business owners and not just investors. And he recognized there's a big line in the sand. There's a big difference between the types of skill sets and the conversations that you have as you venture into business owner and not just investors. So, You know, for me personally, we're looking at our business now. We're trying to make it more efficient. We're trying to make the right decisions in terms of the types of projects that we take on moving forward over the next 12 months as we're trying to shed some some anchor projects and some things that have just been hanging around and being much more difficult to redevelop than we thought. So how do we make sure that we continue to succeed and make money when we've got to shed some of these anchor type projects? And so the best way to do that is to essentially, we have to take on quicker turn type projects in the interim and kind of fill our pipeline with those while we work off the longer term ones that have been with us for a while. So that's a business owner decision. And then for me, it's a pretty easy decision. But again, it's a skill set that I built over time and it's things that I need to recognize. And, you know, I'm a work in progress as well. I don't have all the answers and I'm not perfect as a business owner. There's no question about that. But you do get better at this over time and you need to audit yourself both as an investor and your skill sets and the things you're doing as an investor, but also audit yourself as a business owner as you move forward. And then, of course, on the backside of that mountain, as you kind of uh, go through this progression, you build up enough, you know, wealth, capital, whatever it is, that eventually you can hand the capital to somebody that's uh, still got a lot of hunger to climb the mountain. You take a nice return and you secure it against the real estate, and then you eliminate a lot of the BS and stuff that you got to do on a daily basis. So that's kind of the promised land. That's the end, you know, result that we all look to get to at some point. But that's really the process of 
becoming an investor, becoming a business owner that invests in real estate, and then becoming a passive investor on the tail end of that. So hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. Listen to it a couple of times, really absorb it, but understand where you're at in the journey. Understand, are you an investor that's going to transition to a business owner? Or are you going to stay an investor? Or have you made that transition? And are some of those skill sets that I mentioned things that you really need to work on and focus on as you move forward to help ensure your success? All right, guys, hopefully you dug this main topic. All right, folks, we are wrapping up another episode here of the Real Deals Podcast. Like I said, this was a solo show, and occasionally I'm going to pop back in and do these. I, I like to do them, and you know, sometimes in my own business here, I'm dealing with things or growing as a business owner, which we all should strive to continually do. And as I do that, there's topics that come up that I think are important because they're challenges that I'm dealing with personally, and you know, that makes it a very relevant conversation for me and the microphone, which then allows you guys to listen in. So hopefully you enjoyed this week's topic, it's important to differentiate the skill sets that are necessary to be an investor versus an entrepreneur or a business owner that invests as part of the business. So before I get out of here, as I always do, I've got a closing success quote for you. And this week's quote is by the Cubes, Mr. Mark Cuban, who has had some pretty big wins over the course of his life. And he's a pretty outspoken billionaire. He's got a pretty cool gig. He owns Dallas Mavericks. That would be a pretty sweet deal. Love to own the Portland Trailblazers someday. Not sure Paul Allen's ever going to sell it, but I got to figure out a way to scrap together about a billion dollars. I think that's probably about what they're worth somewhere in there. And, you know, maybe I can put a deal together, but well, we'll see. We'll see. Until then, I've got this quote from Mark Cuban, and the quote is, it's not about money or connections. It's the willingness to outwork and outlearn everyone when it comes to your business. And if it fails, you learn from what happened and do a better job next time. I thought that applied well. I did a lot of things wrong when I started my mortgage company, and I tried to do things right when I started the development company, and I made some mistakes there as well, but that's part of business. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. The important thing is don't make the ones that kill you or you know put you under in terms of your business, but learn from all the mistakes that you made and become a better business owner and a better investor on the other side. All right, guys, this wraps up episode 208, The Real Deals Podcast. I'll see you all next week. My idle hands lead to evil thoughts That's what I was told I see a devil trying to creep on up Ain't gonna get inside my soul So let the demons go and hide me up Cause motherfucker I ain't dead till I say so Cause I've been fighting all my fucking life So I'ma send to the motherfucking end Oh no, oh Oh no, no, don't you understand that I've been going around this world Oh, don't you understand that I've lost time and I can't lose more, no All I got is money on my mind, so just miss me with these motherfucking 50 million problems Every single day I wake up and I try to solve them Dreaming of a future with some motherfucking options Fifty million, hundred million, living like a bullshit. Catch me in the crowd, smoking loud.
up in the marsh pit Screaming obnoxious till I'm fucking nauseous I'll be going crazy till I'm motherfucking dead I got angels on my shoulders with the devil in my head Try to solve them Dreaming of a future with some motherfucking options